And uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, second time actually attending and speaking at uh, Berlin Buzzwords. So thank you for having me. Um, and hope you enjoy the, the program today. So today I'll be talking about open standards for machine learning deployment. Uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a principal engineer at IBM, where I work for the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, or CODE. I focus on machine learning and AI applications. I'm an Apache Spark committer and PMC member on that project, um, and I talk at various events throughout the world on topics related to machine learning, uh, AI, and data science. Um, quickly, a little bit about the CODE team. Uh, it's a relaunch of a team that used to be called the Spark Technology Center within IBM. That's uh, when I joined. Um, and it used to focus primarily on Apache Spark and the surrounding you know, data science and big data ecosystem. Since then, we've expanded to encompass the end-to-end -end enterprise AI lifecycle out in open source and trying to improve that. So um, that still includes Spark, but also uh, the Python data science stack, uh, more recently the deep learning frameworks, um, a few uh, projects related to AI fairness, uh, robustness, explainability, um, and open source um, model deployment and uh, training frameworks. And today I'll be talking primarily about the model deployment phase and how open standards such as PFA, PMML, and Onyx can assist. So to start with, we need to kind of think about uh, you know, what is machine learning, why has it become so popular? Um, and the hype around machine learning ranges from you know, killer robots that are going to destroy humanity all the way through to um, benevolence that can uplift and, us and save humanity and everything in between. But the reality is uh, machine learning is just learning from data to make predictions. And typically learning from historical data to make predictions about the future. So machine learning models are not particularly useful in and of themselves. What is useful about them is applying machine learning. And that's where we learn from historical data to make predictions about the future for the purpose of making decisions and actually acting uh, in, the, in the real world. And if we build up a set of machine learning models within a larger system, we get to what I really think of as, as uh, the real AI these days. So it's not artificial general intelligence, but it's intelligent systems. It's, really, it's complex systems meshed together, including significant machine learning capability, um, but it encompasses a lot of what is just part of normal software systems. What drives an intelligent system is the ability to make uh, decisions in an automated manner, to continually learn from feedback as new data comes in and adapt uh, to the environment, uh, to learn and to generalize to new situations. And why is it topical now, you know, in this era of uh, significantly larger compute capacity, new algorithms, and, and primarily much, much larger data sets and richer data sets? Um, we've seen applications in uh, you know, reinforcement learning in games, in smart farming, smart cities, autonomous vehicles, recommendation systems and personalization fraud detection, uh, and steps towards more general AI, these com you know, complex intelligent systems um, like question answering, Jeopardy, IBM's Project Debater, for example, which, uh, which, which was uh, being able to debate against a human, com uh, a human opponent. So the reality of actually building these machine learning systems is all about the machine learning workflow and how we, we go from data to, uh, to value. And the perception out there tends to be that you start with data, you apply machine learning, um, and then you go home, you, your job done, right? Take your, take your bonus. But the reality is that this is a very really complex workflow and it spans teams. So you start with the data side and that's typically your domain of your data engineers, you have uh, various data sets, disparate schemas, some of it's historical, some of it's arriving in real time. That gets thrown over the organizational boundary to the data science and research team. They ingest that data into their, their pipeline. They're looking at data processing, uh, data visualization, feature transformation and extraction and engineering, and then moving on to the core workflow of model selection and evaluation, that model training, which is what all data scientists really want to work on. And that's where often the discussion stops. But a machine learning model that's been trained is not very valuable unless you can actually deploy it and make use of it you know, in the real world, in a live system, to predict giving you data. And that's where, again, there's an organizational boundary and 
that typically gets thrown over the wall to your, ma your machine learning engineers, your production engineers who are running the production infrastructure. And it's you know, here, here's a bunch of Python code, productionize that. So it spans these, these teams and also tools. So within uh, each step of that pipeline, but certainly within the, the, the typical data science workflow, there's a plethora of tools out there, data formats. Uh, each data scientist wants to use their own favorite toolkit uh, and language. And to support that in production, you need to support all of these because you can't just support one language. You can't just support one framework. And finally, that entire pipeline and this entire set of machine learning code is actually only really a small piece, but important piece of the puzzle. So I like this diagram taken from the Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems paper from Google, where it shows that really that machine learning code is, is much hype, but it's a, a tiny piece of this entire thing. And uh, that code, and in particular the model that's deployed, needs to actually interface with all of these other systems, particularly analysis tools, serving infrastructure, monitoring. And that's why interchange formats start becoming important. So for machine learning deployment, once that model is trained, how do we actually get it out there? Um, and I think we need to answer three questions. The first is what, where, and how. So what are we deploying? What do we mean by a machine learning model? Uh, where are you deploying? What is the target environment? Is it going to an edge device, browser, you know, cloud cluster, batch streaming real time? How are you actually scoring? And then finally, how are you deploying? That's really um, a DevOps question, a sort of software question. How are you actually physically um, or virtually deploying that, that machine learning code? Uh, what is the serving framework you're using, cluster mechanism, et cetera? So today, I won't really be talking much about the, the last two, but really focusing on, on the what. Uh, what are we actually deploying? So the first question there is, what is a model? What, uh, when we talk about a machine learning model, most people talk about, think about um, a, an algorithm. And the algorithm has been trained on some data, and it has a set of weights, parameters that have been learned, and we're done, right? But if we act, go and look at the, the entire training pipeline, it starts with that data phase, and we have to take the data, extract it, transform it. Um, we have to look at extracting features, creating new features from the existing uh, features and variables, pre-processing, feature transformations, feature engineering. And once we've done all of that, then it is in a format, a nice you know, a vector or tensor that we can put into the, the, that machine learning algorithm. And that's then trained, and we have a set of weights, and we can make predictions. But now at prediction time, if we do not do exactly the same steps in exactly the same order, uh, we end up with garbage. So if we don't transform the data, extract the right features, apply the same pre-processing steps, missing value imputation, any, any of those steps, if we don't do them in exactly the same way, then that, model, uh, that set of model weights is effectively useless because the data the shape of the data and you know, the, the distribution of the data that is arriving is not the same as it's been trained on. So we have to think about deploying the entire pipeline, not just the machine learning model or the machine learning algorithm. The data transfer, the feature extraction, the model itself, um, and often overlooked actually the prediction transformation. So many systems don't, don't understand how to consume tensors. If you're integrating a model into um, a wider set of services, into an API, into an application, they're mostly going to speak you know, possibly JSON, uh, something that's you know, machine interpretable, human readable. So that, that post uh, prediction transformation is, is also a step that needs to be encapsulated in that pipeline in order to actually use the model. So we're fortunate that we have pipelines in various frameworks, scikit-learn, SparkML, TensorFlow, R, and various others that allow us to build these abstractions. But we still have to face you know, a lot of challenges in, in this deployment. So we, as we saw in that workflow um, diagram, we need to bridge many, many different things. We need to bridge languages. Um, the data scientist is going to be, use, be using Python, R, maybe developing in notebooks. Production engineers are going to be typically using a high-performance language, um, probably statically typed, Scala, Java, C, Go, um, and others. And we have to bridge that gap. And ideally, you don't want to have to take a, something that's written in Python and now go and rewrite the entire thing in your production uh, your language of choice. You have to bridge many different frameworks. Um, there's way too many to count. I've, I've listed a few on, on the bottom right of the popular ones. Um, the dependencies that, that it all comes with, the versions, you know, so as, you change, uh, as you change versions of that framework, um, you have to support all the different versions, things change. You have to bridge all of these gaps and the performance characteristics across all these, these um, 
uh, dimensions can be highly, highly variable. So if you've deployed a, a Python model, what does that even mean? It could mean that the model is pure Python, in which case maybe it's fast, maybe it's not so fast. It could mean that it's a TensorFlow model or a scikit-learn model with GPU acceleration, in which case it's fast. An R model, similar. So you don't really know. Um, and across languages and frameworks and even versions and dependencies of those frameworks, uh, you can actually have very different performance. You have friction between teams and you have to bridge these organizational boundaries. So data scientists and researchers want to use the latest and greatest. They may want to deploy something off the TensorFlow master branch. Production does not like that. They don't want to be woken up at 3 a.m. 3 with a cluster that's on fire because someone pushed something you know, bleeding edge. They want to have stability control um, and, and be able to control that, that performance. And the business doesn't really care what framework you're using. They don't care if you're using Kubernetes. They don't care if you're using the latest version of TensorFlow. All that they care about is that the system is up and it's having a business impact that, that you're looking for, you know, whether that's recommend uplift or preventing fraud. And finally, you have this proliferation of formats. Each of these framework uh, does everything differently, so they serialize models in their own way. Um, and they're all different and they don't talk to each other. And for proprietary formats, for proprietary products, you furthermore have this, the fact that they're not only not portable and they don't talk to each other, but you have a, a lock-in and you don't even know what that format looks like. So this lack of standardization inevitably leads to custom solutions, custom codes, and where some standards may exist, you, the, the limitations of those standards often lead to custom extensions. So everything becomes custom. So one way of dealing with this and thinking about it is containers. Containers are the panacea for software deployment, right? They are the solution. Well, it's true that they have many benefits for you know, any software deployment, and that applies to machine learning too. So this repeatability and ease of configuration, the fact that it works on your laptop means that it will work you know, on a kube cluster. Um, the separation of concerns for me is the, is the key element here. The data scientists can focus more on the what. What model are they training? What is the framework that they want to use? And the production engineer can focus on the how. So how are we going to take that container and deploy it? How am I going to run my cluster? Um, so it allows the data scientists and researchers to really focus on what they are good at and what they should be doing and to use their framework of choice. Um, and you know, along with your cluster, you get cluster manager and so on. You get a bunch of stuff for free, monitoring, fault tolerance, high availability, and so on. But what goes in that container is still really important because, yes, you can just package up any old Python code. Um, and you can chuck it in a container and throw it over the wall. But you're still not completely sure, um, are those going to, you know, is that code going to meet your SLAs, your performance requirements? Um, did you throw in a, a new version of something where you might degrade performance or even introduce bugs? So you need a, some really uh, critical and comprehensive CI, CD infrastructure to make sure that if you're just throwing things over the, the wall in this, in this containerized manner, that you're doing correct testing. So it still does not solve this issue of standardization. What is the format of the model that is in the container? And what is the APIs exposed? How does the rest of the business, the rest of the services, your application actually interact with the model that is in that container? So I won't talk about APIs today, but we will talk about formats. So a standard, I believe, is the missing piece of the puzzle here. Um, and furthermore, uh, you know, we'll talk more about open standards and why that is important. So why is a standard important? Well, we've seen that there's a whole zoo um, of frameworks and a whole zoo of model formats that comes with them. None of them talk to each other, and it means that if you need to support all of them, uh, you, have, you, you have to have a, a, a runtime, um, DevOps support, um, and look at potentially optimizing the performance of each and every one. If we can export them all to a, a standardized format, then we get a single stack for all of this. So you only have to support one execution engine. Uh, you can potentially optimize against that single format and that single engine, so you can get better performance. And you can build one single set of tools for things like visualizing models, um, analysis, explainability, all of these kind of things, um, instead of building out one for each and every framework. So it takes the separation of concerns to really the next level. It allows true portability of models across all of these dimensions, frameworks, runtimes. The model producer can export to the format and the model consumer, the scoring environment, doesn't have to worry about where it came from. 
doesn't matter if it came from TensorFlow, scikit-learn, which version. All it has to do is uh, conform to the standard and your execution engine can, can run it. So why is an open standard important? So a standard is, uh, is one you know, aspect, but we have this question of open source versus open standard. So an open source, and you know, from a perspective of licensing, is one aspect. So it allows free usage. Um, you can go and inspect the code. You can go and have a look at how TensorFlow, uh, Scikit-Learn, uh, PyTorch serialize their models, and you can write converters and adapters and tools against that. That's great but you don't have any control over how that code evolves. Yes, you can potentially make PRs against it. Um, in some cases, some of these projects have moved towards more public consultation, but ultimately it's controlled by potentially one organization or a small handful. So open governance is critical here, as with most open source software, I believe. So it avoids concentration of control, typically large vendors and companies that are keeping control of a, a critical project, and you have the public visibility um, and consultation process around uh, development processes, planning, roadmaps. There are downsides to a standard, of course. It needs wide adoption, really, to succeed, um, and it can move slowly. You know, adding new features, enhancements, is kind of like designed by committee. But still, you know, the benefits outweigh uh, these, these downsides and costs, I believe. So next, I'll talk about three um, prominent open standards for model deployment uh, currently. And the first of these is uh, Predictive Model Markup Language, or PMML. So this is actually really old. Um, first release was in 1997. So it's been around for more than 20 years. Um, it's an XML-based model format uh, that was created by the Data Mining Group, of which IBM is a founding member. Uh, DMG is a consortium of industry players, um, vendors, um, and, and organizations who are you know, either building products uh, or consuming machine learning in some way. Um, it's widely used and supported now over 30 vendors. Um, and actually, one of our own team members, uh, Svetlana, is the release manager for PFA, uh, PMML as well as PFA, which we'll talk about. Um, so because it's, it's been around for a long time, um, it covers a, a wide range of, of, of converters you know, for Spark, Scikit-Learn, R, XGBoost, LightGBM. Any of your favorite toolkits are probably going to have some form of support. So it's an XML format. What, what does that actually entail? What goes in there? Um, so this is just a sort of high-level overview of some of the components. But effectively, you have at the top um, a, a header, which can, may contain some additional metadata about what is the, the application, versions, um, you know, a little bit more about the model. Uh, you have a, a, a definition of the data dictionary, what all the fields are. So these are the, uh, the, feature, um, the features or the variables that, uh, that, you can, that you can have in the model. Um, and you have various data types that you can, that you can define, you know, whether it's string, categorical, um, or a, you know, a list of those things. Not shown here, but you have an, the ability to, uh, to have uh, data transformations as a next step. So how does each one of these raw data fields get, sh get transformed into some other value that is then fed directly into the model? And then you have a model definition. So in this case, you know, a multinomial logistic regression model. Um, and it has uh, the parameter matrix and the, pr the list of parameters and various other um, you know, components that are required in order to score it. The coverage of PM PMML, since it's been around for quite a long time, and since it's effectively quite, a, quite an old standard, um, you can see that it covers the, the, the more traditional machine learning models that we, that we have out there. Um, so most of what you would ha have in your standard set of tools uh, are covered, and it, it does cover neural networks. Um, but the support there is actually fairly limited, so it doesn't, doesn't support the more modern neural network architectures, deep learning architectures, convolutions, and so on. Um, but various feature transformations and you know, a whole, a whole uh, you know, recipe list of models are, are supported. So some of the shortcomings of PMML in particular is that uh, it, it can only represent what is part of the standard. So there is some uh, support for kind of user-defined functions and composing models together, but if something is not in the standard and kind of defined as a model type, um, then it's impossible to represent it. So what you have in this case is uh, the ability to have extension points um, at various, in each part of the spec. So a lot of the time that is going to be 
you know, custom data transformations and custom models. So this is great, except for the fact that a custom extension point you know, breaks the standardization. So within your organization, that can work. But as soon as you uh, cross organizational boundaries, if you want to publish a model, or even you know, uh, across bound boundaries within your organization that you know, may not be able to support that particular plugin for whatever reason, you lose all the ben benefits of standardization and you end up with a lot of custom tooling and glue code uh, around that. Um, a key aspect of the open source community around PMML is that the scoring engine itself has you know, potential questions around the licensing, um, AGPL3 commercial dual license. So many organizations you know, are a little bit hesitant to, to use that as a result. So while exporters are, um, are well supported and you can export from most libraries and most frameworks, the evaluation side is, is, is more tricky. So you've ended up with many companies having proprietary evaluation engines, and again, that's, that's more difficult from an open source perspective. The next standard is a Portable Format for Analytics, or PFA. Now, PFA was also created by the Data Mining Group more recently, um, and specifically it was made to address some of these shortcomings that PMML uh, has. So PMML is less flexible, because it's quite prescriptive about you know, what, what are the model types and what are the specific data transformations. PFA tried to be more generic and raise that level of, ab of abstraction. So it's a, it's a JSON serialization format versus XML, um, and it uses a, a standardized Avro format schema uh, for data types. So any Avro type, can, any type can be represented as an Avro type, which means you can, uh, you can represent just about anything. And PFA tries to effectively be a mini language, a sort of functional math language, together with this schema specification. And it focuses more on building blocks and allowing you to compose them together in, functional, in a functional manner to try and make pretty much any uh, analytic workflow or pipeline or model expressible. So a simple example, also using the multi-class logistic regression. Um, the first component that we have is specifying the input and output types using Avro schemas. So on the left we have, uh, for example, this model will take in a feature vector, which is represented here as a, a dense vector, an array of doubles. Um, and it'll output, in this case, um, again, a, a numerical value, which will be the class prediction. This output could actually be, um, and it, in real world cases, act, usually is, um, consisting of multiple fields. So it'll be an Avro record that could have um, the class, uh, the class index prediction, which we have here, could have the class label, could have probabilities, um, and all that kind of, you know, all the, all the extra information you may need uh, in your model. And on the right, we have the specification of the action. So the action is effectively the function to be applied on the input uh, to produce that output. So if you take, if you plug in the input into that action, and you get, you should get back the output, and you can compose these functions. So here you have. Uh, working from the inside out, and, and you know, the JSON is human readable, but it's really meant to be you know, uh, manipulated by machines rather than humans, so it can be a little, uh, get a little bit verbose. But effectively, you start with a, a linear regression model um, function, which takes the input and um, a cell. The cell we'll talk about in a little bit, but that is effectively the model parameters and or weights. That is a convenience wrapper around you know, a vector.product plus a bias, the kind of thing that you'd you know, do sta standard, in a very standard way in, in you know, Python, NumPy, followed by uh, then a softmax and an argmax, and you get, you get out the class prediction. So even though it does look a little bit for, for both in terms of the representation, it's doing exactly what you would do um, in a fairly simple way in kind of calling a bunch of Python functions. And that's really what it's trying to achieve. So I mentioned cells, and that's one of the ways, the key way you, that you manage state within a PFA document. So you, uh, cells specify the data storage, um, and you can think of this as kind of a, a named you know, global variable. And typically you'll store states such as the model parameters, um, vec, you know, um, uh, vocabulary mappings, and so on. So here we have an example where uh, this would be a, maybe a vocabulary mapping from uh, text terms uh, to, to uh, integer values, uh, locations in a vector for some you know, natural language processing task. So again, the types of val are specified using Avro schemas. And what's key here is that the cell values are mutable within an action, but they effectively get reset um, between executions of a, of a given document. So every time you score a document, that's 
starting cell value will be in place. You can manipulate it as you go if you need to build up, for example, a, a new vocabulary or something like that, or make changes to it. Um, but you're guaranteed that it, it'll be the same when you start out. Uh, pools, by, uh, by comparison, are the same thing as cells, but they are mutable across actions. So you can think of them more as a database table uh, or a field within a database table that you, you can actually update as you go. So running counts or something like that in, in an application. Other features um, that PFA has, it's, it has various um, elements of a programming language. So some control flows, conditionals and loops. Uh, you can use local variables, uh, user-defined functions, including lambdas or, or anonymous functions, uh, typecasts, null checking, some very basic error handling um, that, that is somewhat useful. And importantly, a very comprehensive built-in library. So all the standard math, string, array types, uh, linear algebra, statistics, time series, um, as well as uh, date-time types, and built-in support for some common models, trees, clustering, linear models, and so on. The current status of PFA, uh, there's a reference implementation which is open source called Hadrian. And that was developed by the Open, open Data Group. Uh, it is it's become a little bit less supported, so it hasn't seen that much activity recently. But it does cover PFA export um, within Python and R, and it covers, covers scoring within the JVM, Python, and R. Uh, so PFA, what does it do well? Uh, the type system um, provides you, you know, a very strong and standardized way of specifying types. Um, and you can actually st statically verify that at runtime. So when you load a PFA document, you can perform a static analysis and know that you're not going to have any, um, any type-related errors. You might have runtime errors related to you know, numerical stuff, but you're not going to have any, um, any type-related errors. So it, it's similar to a statically typed language um, and the same benefit from that perspective. Uh, you can compose uh, both built-in functions and user-defined functions in an arbitrary way. So this functional approach is very flexible. Um, and together with control flow and the strong support for tr traditional machine learning operators, it means that you can effectively build just about anything and represent just about any anal analytic workflow or ML model within PFA. There are some major missing features, uh, limitations. So one of them is that uh, vectors have to be specified, vectors and, and I suppose one or two D tensors need to be specified as either dense or sparse, whereas in, in most frameworks and in most real world applications, you want to be able to mix and match these things. So scikit-learn, for example, will use um, either NumPy dense arrays or SciPy sparse arrays uh, interchangeably, and you can actually pass either one, or you can have a mixed uh, data set of them, and the framework will do the right thing. Not the case here. There's no support for generic tensors of higher rank, so you're, it's, you're the typical um, data types that will be used in, for example, deep learning, um, so images or, or representing, you know, uh, videos as, as 3D tensors or 4D tensors, whatever the case may be. There's no support for that, as well as built-in functions for deep learning. So your traditional convolutional operators, recurrent operators, um, GPU awareness, anything that you need to actually support a deep learning application um, doesn't exist. And then finally, it is a relatively new standard, so there are some open questions around you know, what is the industry usage and adoption, what is the performance uh, at scale? So I'll briefly mention a project that, that our team uh, developed at open source called uh, Artvark. Uh, that's PFA export for Spark ML pipelines. Um, and because scoring existed in, uh, for PFA in the JVM, but no export, uh, Artvark provides a core export DSL in Scala for actually creating documents. Um, and it is, uh, this Spark ML component is, uses that core uh, DSL to export Spark ML components to PFA. So this is an example of, of how you would export a Spark logistic regression model um, to PFA. So the, the, the model cell is, um, is the same reference to the cell that we saw before, and the action, as you can see there, is very similar to the JSON that we saw before, the linear regression, softmax, argmax. So as I mentioned, Artvark is open source. It's been out for a while. Uh, there's the, the GitHub link, um, and it's actually interesting to see other, other companies and open source projects starting to pick it up. For example, Salesforce in their, um, in their Spark um, auto AI project Transmogrify, they use for local scoring, they're using uh, the PFA uh, as a format and they're using Artvark to, uh, to do the export. So any help would be welcome. You know, it, it, 
there's still a lot that, that could be done. Um, it, it's obviously difficult to keep up these projects, and we haven't been able to do that much recently. Uh, so we'd welcome, if, you, if, if this interests you, we'd welcome any and your help and, and collaboration out there. Uh, so for, for PFA, some of the future directions we are looking at are extending our work in Artvark, looking at performance testing, you know, improvements to the standard, thinking about can it be used for deep learning, can we extend the standard to, uh, you know, to allow operators for GPUs and tensors. And speaking of deep learning, that brings us to uh, the final standard, which, which I think is also possibly the most interesting at this juncture. Um, and that's the Open Neural Network Exchange, or ONIX. Uh, so this was uh, released fairly recently, um, championed initially by Facebook and Microsoft, but large industry players have really jumped on, uh, including IBM, uh, NVIDIA, AWS. Uh, it's a lot more focused on, on deep learning, and in a similar way to PFA, it is self-describing. So a PFA document, uh, if you have a valid PFA JSON, that encapsulates everything you need to know about the model. Uh, any model state and, and parameters as well as what, what actual computation occurs on the input to create the output. So if you have a compliant engine, you can score that document. And in much the same way, uh, a valid Onyx protocol buffer, which is the format that they use, uh, can be used in a, uh, in a valid runtime, scoring runtime, to, uh, to score that. Um, and you don't need any additional information. It encapsulates the weights, as well as the computation graph um, of operators that are applied on the input tensors and data types to get the output. So it is more focused on deep learning. It has built-in support for uh, your traditional deep learning operators, convolutions, um, more recently some con elementary control flow and recurrent operators, um, a little bit of support for image processing. So it's a lot more focused on your, your traditional you know, image classification, object detection type of applications. Uh, there is, however, a really interesting part of the spec which is called Onyx ML. And this, this covers uh, more traditional machine learning models. So it introduces additional types, like uh, lists of values and maps. These are the kind of things that one needs to, you know, for example, do text feature extraction and map you know, text terms into, uh, into vectors. Um, and various additional operators that are specific to, uh, or let's say not specific to deep learning, but more machine learning in general, feature preprocessing. Uh, pre uh, vectorizing data, one-hot encoding and, and label encoding, scaling data, and some support, built-in support for your traditional models. So some interesting recent developments around Onyx. At the end of last year, the, uh, a scoring engine was released by Microsoft, which is uh, the Onyx runtime. That's open source. And it also supports the full spec, including Onyx ML. So up until then, uh, even though you, you, you had the ability to score, you know, wider deep learning, uh, deep learning and machine learning pipelines, including traditional machine learning, uh, in theory, you, didn't, you couldn't do that in practice unless you built your own engine. So you, know, you could take an Onyx model and you know, put it into TensorFlow, for example, but it, um, you couldn't support, for example, the Onyx ML part of the spec. So now that we have this, this runtime available, it opens up uh, actually being able to use the full, part, the full spec to do scoring. There's been a lot of recent activity in various exporters for Spark, Scalearn, Keras, LightGBM. Um, and mo most recently, uh, Onyx has now moved to an open governance model. So it's, it's not within a, a, a foundation, for example, um, but it is taking an open governance model, um, which is a great step to see. So some of the future directions around Onyx is that there's an Onyx training working group, which has really taken off and is quite active. And um, that is looking to actually enable Onyx not just for model scoring, but for, to, to provide an interchange format for model training that would support, for example, training a model in TensorFlow and exporting that and, and doing fine tuning in PyTorch. So at the moment, that's not possible. Uh, performance testing and improvements that, that you know, our team and others are looking at. Um, Onyx is relatively new. Performance seems quite good, but uh, there hasn't been that much large-scale benchmarking um, and, and releasing that out into the open community to, to see what are the limitations um, and where performance needs to be improved. Um, extensions to the Onyx ML ecosystem, uh, a lot of work happening in these exporters, as I mentioned. There's still limited support for some text preprocessing, tokenization and other um, use cases in NLP, and still limited support for image preprocessing. So if you compare, for example, the functionality in TensorFlow image that can do a lot of different types of preprocessing, resize, crop, scale, um, you know, change formats. Um, effectively, there's, there's, very, there's, there's, there's resize and crop, I think, is the only thing in, in Onyx. Okay, so in summary, um, 
for each of the formats, uh, PMML is an established standard backed by um, the data mining group, widely supported. There's very strong support for the standard machine learning models and feature processing. Um, you can have custom extensions to get around the limitations, but that's also the main downside of PMML because custom extensions break the standard. So there's less flexibility on the downside, the, the state of the open source scoring engine, poor GPU uh, deep learning support. Uh, for PFA, again, backed by a wide consortium of DMG, there's growing adoption of, you know, within the open source community and, and large companies. Um, to my mind, it has the greatest level of flexibility and extensibility. It can handle pretty much anything, um, any model or, or you know, analytic application or feature processing workflow can be represented with a few small exceptions. But on the downside, it's still relatively new. Adoption hasn't really taken off um, as much as one, one, one might hope. It's complex and difficult to learn. Uh, quite a few questions still around you know, performance and scalability, the state of the open source engine, is it being developed, um, and no support for GPUs. Uh, Onyx, uh, backed by very large industry players, growing very rapidly, has a huge amount of momentum behind it. Focused on deep learning, but the Onyx ML part of the spec has a lot of scope and, and uh, potential to, to grow into that, um, the, the gap that is there and, and, and the gap that PFA is trying to fill. And I, I think that there's a lot of op options around um, extending on XML to, to better provide for traditional machine learning and feature processing. Um, but it's still relatively new. Uh, it's difficult to keep up with the breadth and depth of frameworks like TensorFlow and, and PyTorch. They're moving so quickly that Onyx, um, you know, a standard is going to struggle for a while to keep up with all of the functionality. Um, and it still has relatively poor support for, your, for some traditional machine learning operators, uh, feature preprocessing, uh, text-based um, in particular. Uh, there's no support for things like date times and, and some other uh, variable types that, that one might use in traditional machine learning. So finally, you know, I believe open standards for serialization and deployment of these analytic workflows and models give you this true portability and separation of concerns that you need, breaking that um, breaking that, that sort of chain of throwing things over the wall and having to rewrite either rewrite code or support a plethora of frameworks uh, and allows the, the model producer and the consumer to be fully independent and, and that allows each of those uh, w workflows and teams and, and components to optimize for what they need to be good at. So it solves a significant pain point in the machine learning community for deployment and it does this in a truly open manner, both open source and open governance. Uh, there are risks. You know, the, some of these standards, PFA and Onyx, are still relatively new. They're gaining adoption. They're moving very quickly, so they don't support everything that one might need. Uh, performance is relatively untested for some of them, um, those two in particular. And limitations. You know, can one standard ever encompass anything? Um, probably not, but in that case, what, what does one do? Do you, do you abandon the standard and, and just do custom code and Docker containers? Do you use the standard where it's good and, and try and standardize the pre-processing code, for example? Is there a, you know, an option to use PFA and Onyx together? Um, these are things to, to consider. So finally, get involved. It's all open source. It's out there. It's open governance. If you're interested, uh, you know, find everything on GitHub um, and, and the web, and please get involved. Thank you very much. Awesome. It was a great talk. Anybody has a questions? We have a couple of minutes for asking them. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really nice. Um, I have a question related to uh, evaluation for the models. Are any of the open governance, government standards you mentioned support evaluation, either online or offline? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so by evaluation, I, I assume you mean um, you know, evaluating on a, on a test data set or, or hold, hold that data set. Uh, and the answer is, is they don't support it um, in any structured way out the box, uh, but you could certainly do it yourself. So, you know, for example, if, if you're using scikit-learn and you know, you're building a pipeline, you'd, you'd do, be doing cross-validation and you'd be doing your evaluation during that, that phase. Um, if you exported that to uh, Onyx, for example, or PFA or PMML, then that model can certainly be used in a different scoring environment. Um, so you could load it in the scoring engine, the standardized scoring engine, or, an, or another framework, and you could do that evaluation you know, on, on test data in, in some other way. But it doesn't have any built-in functionality for that, so not directly. Um, th that is certainly something that's being looked at, um, in particular for PFA, there have been proposals for um, other ways to incorporate 
some of that model evaluation, or at least the metadata in there, so you can sort of see, okay, this model was, was trained on a certain data set, um, and this is the performance characteristics and results on that test data set and so on. So it's more around metadata, uh, but nothing actually in the standard at this point. Yeah. So last question. Is there also a way to define like targets and sources for the data? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, not at the moment. So it, it's, it, it really starts at the schema definition and ends at the, you know, the output schema definition. Um, so at, you know, the application code is responsible for getting the, the raw data that's coming maybe from a database or from you know, HDFS or from JSON and transforming that at least in, at the, you know, into the initial version of, of the data. Um, so typically for PFA, that will be Avro or JSON. So it does tend to map quite well. You, know, you can pull data from a database table or from an API, uh, REST API call. It'll arrive in, let's say, JSON with a bunch of strings and numbers. And that you can almost directly put into PFA uh, as one example. Um, PMML will have its own adapters. So not directly, but, um, but some of them are, are a little bit better for, for kind of taking in the data in a more raw form, probably PFA. Onyx and... and um, Onyx and PMML you know, accept protocol buffers that are a tensor or they accept uh, his own application code for how to pass that in. I hope that answers the question. Um, no, we're already like, running out of the time. Thank you again for okay. amazing answers as well. Thanks so much.